بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله Uh, we have continued our discussion on the nature of how we are going to understand the integration of our four realms of existence that is spiritual, emotional, mental and physical based on the model which have developed that is positive Islamic psychology model and how we are actually translating this into research R&D into uh, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy and our version of positive Islamic cognitive behavior therapy by CBT. Yeah? So you must understand how we go about with it and there is this whole chapter in this book, Post Islamic Psychology, A Transcendent Model to Achieve Peace, Happiness and Success. And in this chapter, we discuss about CBT and how we can integrate. This is chapter 7 eh, in this book. And I just want to read just in the introduction. And then I'll explain to you what are the material that we have in this book. And I'll show you a video of the most research, recent research in terms of integration. Uh, there are many substantial research in the field of psychology throughout the world, especially in the top universities. Eh? One of the most research modality is cognitive behavior therapy or CBT. CBT is now widely used in the treatment of a whole range of psychological, psychiatric problems. It has demonstrated significant rate of success. However, it's still imperfect. From the, our perspective as Muslims, maybe in the secular, materialistic, uh, cognitive psychologist world, well, yes, it is perfect. But to us, it is not perfect because as I mentioned earlier, of the, the argument that I brought about of the level of from cognitive to mindfulness, from mindfulness to the heart base, and from heart base to understanding the spirituality and how we can integrate this whole scheme of knowledge which is now growing very, very rapidly. All right? So from our perspective, we have our Islamic model, which I have explained to you of how we are going to develop this by CBT and our principles are four principles of first, acknowledging the Creator, secondly, understanding our transcendent nature, that we are not a physical being but a spiritual being in a physical world, spiritual being in a physical world and third on understanding that we have a role to play to do good, to help others to be good as a caliph of Allah and to make this world good and number fourth is to understand the whole idea of behavior and holistic learning which I will show you this latest research okay when Professor Muhammad Mali Jenkins this author wrote this some 30-40 years ago he do not have that research so now we have the research so this basically if we are going to use that we can uh, develop a very good modality based on the latest research of how this integration is going to take place. So if we study, this is in this book, uh, I take this application, practical application of CBT, and we talk about practical application of CBT, we also can talk about practical application of the enhanced CBT, which is we call PI CBT, right? We're talking about PI C D. This is our Y. We start with the base. We are not destroying the base. We, we have to use all the modality, all the research that has been done now. But now this research has gone beyond CBT at a much higher level. So we also will have to integrate that. Because if you look at a CBT model, this is what they say about the practical application of CBT. They, they have divided into three. Psychol psychiatric disorder, psychological problems, and medical problems. So if you look at so psychiatric disorder, there are many, many research in terms of major depressive, uh, depressive disorder. So there, is, there are a lot of research in CBT, of applying CBT in, into major depressive disorder. They're talking about geriatric depression, old people getting depressed. They're talking about geriatric anxiety disorder, old people getting anxiety, literally in the sense of loss of partnership, uh, loss of children, maybe getting old, and many, many of the problems of old age now, now is now uh, becoming a uh, snowballing into a very huge problem in the Western world, where now they are also talking about euthanasia. That means killing yourself before uh, you get uh, incapable and so on. So these this are now being discussed, and some, some states have already legislated that you, it is all right to kill yourself using you, you, uh, this kind of uh, assisted suicide and so on, which I think it is a degeneration of the whole whole idea of being human, right? Then we have uh, panic disorder, agoraphobia, social phobia, op op obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. It's a very, very huge problem now because, again, there is no solution, but it is the therapeutic approach do in some way have some success rate, but not a lot. We have conduct disorder, substance abuse, which is huge. 
abuse, substance abuse for alcohol, drug, uh, synthetic drug, uh, cocaine, heroin, and so on. And then we have for children a lot of this problem now. Attention deficit hyper disorder, very huge problem. Now a lot of children are put on medication as young as six years old, which is terrible. How are we going to actually uh, form the brain? Because if the brain is used to this kind of uh, chemical enhancement through, through drugs, the, gray, the brain is not going to grow. And I'll show you in the video how we actually behavioral from the level of the children going up through social emotional learning can actually reduce that. That means the learning that involves harm. Okay, we have health anxiety, body dis morphotic disorder, eating disorder, personality disorder, sex offender, happy disorder, bipolar disorder, sclerophenia. Huh? Sclerophenia, so we have this whole list of just some of the level of research that we can find research papers in terms of CBT. There's now thousands of them all over the world. And they have some success and they have some failures, but the research is ongoing. Second area we, have, we can tackle through CBT or by CBT that is the problems of psychological problems that relate to individual, couples problem, family problem, pathological gambling, complicated grief or extended grief, caregiver distress, anger, hostility and so many other uh, which I have listed in the book. Okay? Or how we can do positive slime cognitive behavior therapy group counseling so that we can actually bring down the cost of actually reaching out to the Ummah because if every mosque Every place of Islamic assembly can have some sort of coaching, life coaching, as well as counseling problem through certified counselors. Then, inshallah, we will lessen the impact in Islamic practices. Then they have medical problem with psychological component. These are involving a lot of problems of people today that they have, for example, like chronic back pain, they have sickle disease, pain, migraine, headaches, tinnitus. All right, cancer pain, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, rheumatoid arthritis kind of disease, pain, erectile dysfunction, insomnia, obesity, hypertension, and many others. So all this actually, if we look at this practical application, we as Muslims must develop an, an equivalent. No doubt, now we don't have the equivalent because uh, unfortunately, as I said, this whole field of psychology is very, very young in the Muslim Ummah, that's why I'm doing this video. Uh, I'm not that much of a psychologist, but Alhamdulillah is just to give you some sort of uh, motivation that there's so many areas that if just one area of substance abuse, for example, if you're going to be a specialist in that area alone, we can help a large number, millions and millions of Muslims are affected. In Malaysia alone, there's so many millions of young people now, all right, maybe more than a million, who are on substance abuse, they are math, they are on uh, drug, they are on, on some sort of psychotropic uh, herbs like uh, kuntum leaf or water, whatever. They, they, it's all kind of nonsense that is going on. How are we going to help them uh, to create a purpose and meaning so that they can understand this whole idea? So I'm going to give you a video to show you that this is not the all and the all, but the whole idea is molding the brain from POSPAS PICBT model, the help of PICBT model. This is our model, where we, we mentioned that we have the four level of existence, our roh, our kal, our kal, and our fissile, jasad. And this total thing is our totality. Our totality, we call it TPLH, total past learning history. This is what we are, all right? And it will affect our behavior and so on, future behavior. So the behavior will come from here, either positive or negative. We have this inner speech, but we are influenced by the physical environment. That means how we live in the physical existence and uh, following Maslow hierarchy of needs, which is quite a lot uh, have to do with the physical situation. Then we have the social environment. That means intra, internal, and inter-social environment from the self to the family to the society and so on. And then how inner speech can change this whole negative influences if there is. And develop a positive perception and develop a positive worldview based on spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical integration, synergy, and uh, coherence. Because we have this whole idea of coherence which I mentioned earlier in the earlier thing. So many more research now have shown that this model, inshallah, is the best model. So how are we going to harness our model? This is 
positive slamming cognitive behavior therapy model, and we would then develop from this model the understanding of how we're going to apply to now the base is CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and moving upward in the thing, high CBT. Yeah? Okay? So I'll show you some video and then we will end this talk. that I'd like you to uh, walk away with from my presentation today, it's that social-emotional learning changes the brain. And the brain is really the organ that is the target of these interventions. So this is uh, a very ambitious outline of what I hope to cover. I'm going to tell you a snippet about neuroplasticity, the idea that the brain is the organ that's built to change in response to experience. I'll then tell you a little bit about what we know about one of the key attributes which is shaped by social and emotional learning, which is a child's capacity to regulate her or his emotions. And finally, I'm going to conclude by suggesting that we can change the brain by training the mind through social and emotional learning. We know that environmental factors influence and shape the brain. Uh, we know that the emotional environment in early life in particular is absolutely central in shaping the circuits of the brain in ways that persist throughout a, an organism's entire uh, adult lifespan. The brains of children are constantly being shaped. They're literally being molded by experience, both of a negative and positive sort, both wittingly and unwittingly. And I think our task must be to take the reins and to promote positive brain changes. And one of the central vehicles is through social and emotional learning. One of the things I tell my students is that behavioral interventions are biological. That is, if you, you do something to intervene in a way that changes behavior, it's got to be the case that you're changing the brain. There's no other way that we know for behavior to change other than through its change in the brain. And in fact, there's every reason to think that behavioral interventions can produce more specific brain changes than any, quote, biological intervention like a medication. Because behavioral interventions have the capacity to affect very specific brain circuits in ways that modern medicine does not have. So I'm going to invite you to consider the idea that social and emotional learning can change brain function and actually brain structure and can produce uh, adaptive emotional and cognitive functioning as a consequence. So for those of you who are not used to looking at brains all the time, um, uh, I want to just show you uh, a little bit about where um, these things occur in the brain, what these circuits are, and time does not permit me to spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just tell you a little bit about this. So the upper left here is the ventral surface of the brain, the bottom side of the brain. If you turn the brain upside down, this is what you would see. And um, the area that's shaded in green here is very important for um, making emotional judgments about information, deciding whether something is good or bad. Uh, and that's called the orbital frontal cortex. Now, this diagram here, the blue area, is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is an area of the brain that historically has not been considered to be important for emotion, but it's critical, we now know, for certain aspects of emotion, particularly the capacity to guide decision making through positive emotion. So if uh, a child has a goal to achieve a certain 
positive outcome and is directing her, his behavior toward the achievement of that goal, we know that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is critical. Um, the, these areas in this bottom diagram here are areas uh, in lower brain regions, subcortical regions that play a very important role in emotion as well. And the area shaded in orange, I'll specifically mention in a few minutes, called the amygdala, is a key site particularly for negative emotions, for detecting threats, and so forth. And this is another important area called the anterior cingulate that's very important in uh, conflict resolution uh, of both a cognitive as well as emotional sort. And uh, again, I'll say a little bit more about these a little later, but um, right now I want to talk a little bit about the prefrontal cortex, this area that Dan mentioned, which uh, up until quite recently was regarded much more in terms of its role in thought than in emotion. Now, this is um, a very interesting study, and I want you to mostly pay attention to these pie charts here, and I'll give you a definition of what these mean. This is a study that's done with kids, with adolescents, and with adults, all of whom are performing the same kind of uh, working memory task. This is a task where if, for example, I give you a telephone number, and I ask you to remember the telephone number, I'm going to ask you what that number is in just a couple of minutes. Um, this is what working memory is. It's maintaining information in a conscious buffer. Uh, and it turns out that the prefrontal cortex is very important for that. And if you look at the area that's shaded in blue, um, in these pie charts, it indicates the amount of the prefrontal cortex that's activated as a child, as an adolescent, and as an adult does this task. And you can see in the kids, the area in blue is really a thin slice. But then the adolescent is using a much larger, expansive prefrontal cortex. Much more of the brain that is activated is the prefrontal cortex. And in adults, you see the most extreme um, uh, form of this. Uh, and so there's a huge developmental change between children and adolescents. And in fact, adolescence is a period when the prefrontal cortex is really coming online in very important ways and plays a critical role in the integration of thought and emotion, and particularly in the regulation of emotion. Now, this is a diagram that's meant to illustrate one very important aspect of the regulation of emotion, and it illustrates two hypothetical kids, um, person A and person B, and imagine that something bad happens at this point. There's an episode of bullying or some uh, other, uh, someone says something nasty to a child. And on various physiological parameters, we can measure the time course of a child's response. Uh, and person B is shown to recover much more quickly compared to person A. Uh, person A shows a much more long-lasting, a perseverative response to this negative event. And we've been learning about what are the brain systems that may be involved in these differences among kids. And of course, our goal in social and emotional learning is to foster this kind of pattern, a more adaptive pattern where following uh, a negative event, uh, a child is able to better and more effectively regulate his or her emotions so that they can calm down more quickly, permitting uh, uh, a more effective kind of thinking uh, in that situation. Someone says something nasty to a child, and in you will do better on tests like this of working memory, which other research indicates underlies a lot of academic performance. Now I want to just show you before I end that there are new imaging techniques that we can now use non-invasively and this is the just really, really cool stuff that we're doing now. Um, this actually shows the individual connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala anatomically. We can now visualize this and quantitate it in individual kids, which we are now doing to determine the impact of interventions like social and emotional learning, not just on the functioning of the brain, but literally on the connections between these regions that are absolutely essential to effective 
emotion regulation. So let me summarize and conclude. I've tried to show you that the brain is plastic. It's built to change in response to experience. The prefrontal cortex is absolutely key. We call it a convergence zone for affect and cognition or thought and feeling. And we also know that negative emotions will interfere with cognitive prefrontal function, that is with cognitive operations that are occurring in the prefrontal cortex. Social emotional learning is an empirically verified strategy to improve skills of emotion regulation and social adaptation. And as such, social emotional learning likely produces beneficial changes in the brain. Education that shapes the child's brain and likely produces these kinds of alterations lay the foundation for all future learning, for emotion regulation, and for social functioning. Qualities such as patience, calmness, cooperation, and kindness should really now best be regarded as skills that can be trained. They are not traits that we are irrevocably given by um, our early environment or by our genetics, but everything we now know about the brain, including down to the level of gene expression, indicates that training like social and emotional learning can shape the brain and literally change gene expression in the brain. And research is critically needed now to document the impact of social emotional learning is there any age at which point it may not change? How old is the child? This is not, here's the good news. Definitively, no. No age. It occurs through, plasticity occurs throughout life. We know, and this, this hard data to show this. So we know that, for example, neurogenesis, which is the actual growth of new neurons, which, by the way, is an idea that when I was a graduate student was regarded as fiction. We thought that the brain was different from other organs and not regenerating cells. We now know that that's just definitively not true. Neurogenesis occurs throughout life. It is the case, though, that there are sensitive periods of plasticity. We don't exactly know what those sensitive periods are for social and emotional learning. They're probably not the same kind of steep curves that you see for something like learning a second language, where we know that the period of plasticity it dramatically drops off um, after you uh, pass early adolescence. Uh, so there are likely to be sensitive periods, but I would say that uh, I, based on what we now know, I don't think there's any period after which um, we need to say that the door is closed, although it may take more intensive intervention um, uh, after a certain age. Larry Aber from NYU. You're the affect of chronometry, the um, I comment about how everybody's aroused when the tiger is about to eat us. And, and then there's patterns of change after that. I think it's pretty important to help uh, non-scientists think about context dependence. We don't want to not flee from the tiger. So uh, any thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a very helpful point, and I appreciate you making it. And I, I actually... Uh... <laughs> Alhamdulillah, these are some of the latest research where they are trying to design uh, many, many experiments on the effect of social emotional learning, which actually now is integrating one level higher from the cognitive sciences eh, that in the early 80s, 90s, even in the two, 2000, CBT now it is moving into integrating and because of this advance in uh, neuroscience and this advancement in terms of understanding the nature of our brain we can understand that there are many areas of whatever application of CBT and Pi CBT we need to do a lot of intensive research but inshallah we believe with the integration based on our model the four areas of existence the input from the social physical environment, the social environment, especially for children, as mentioned in this video, it's so critical that the development of our child uh, in the first seven years of their life, as mentioned by the Prophet, 
it's so important that we have to develop the physical environment and the social in environment so that they can develop positive inner speech and development of ideas like love, compassion, kindness, mercy must be integrated into the learning of every Muslim child. So inshallah, as we develop this model, we will try to integrate with the understanding, the depth of our uh, knowledge and how we can do, to bring up wonderful children, wonderful family, wonderful society, wonderful ummah for the future as we develop Islamic psychology and positive Islamic psychology and post-Islamic cognitive behavior therapy as one of the modalities that we hope to present to the world, inshallah.